One interesting thing that happens from time to time when I'm planning and gathering all the information for these videos is I plan a video like today's video and literally the things that I planned into the video start happening to me even more in real life. For example, you guys saw the title of this video. Well, I was originally planning on starting doing this video over by one of the marinas here right across from where I'm at right now on Collins Avenue. However, the traffic was so horrible and there's literally nowhere to park that I had to just totally abandon that idea and shoot over to the neighborhood here because it was basically impossible to uh, do the video I wanted to do. So this first part of the video is going to be a little bit of a rant and sort of a complaint about how everything is getting worse, guys. I'm saying this with a smile on my face because of what just happened and how it literally just came true for me that, you know, the first thing that's worse, obviously, here in Miami is the traffic. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but it is just bonkers this time of year, guys. I'm not even kidding you. It took me a half an hour to get from my place to where I'm standing right now. This should be 10 minute drive tops. I thought this would be an interesting topic to start today's video with because I know it's not just me. I know a lot of you guys who watch my channel can easily relate to the things we're gonna cover today. And I just wanna point out some of the observations on things that I have noticed have gotten noticeably worse since basically the pandemic. I mean, that screwed up everything, right? We can all pretty much agree that ever since the lockdown started and they printed all this money and everything like that was pretty much the beginning of the end when it comes to life as we know it, right? So another perfect example for you guys, I used to go to this gym here, walking distance to where I live, and the gym was not the greatest gym, but it was okay. You know, like it had everything you needed, and um, you know, it was affordable. I could walk there, like I said. Now, this place is an absolute dungeon, guys. First of all, they were closed during the pandemic, just like all the other gyms were, at least for like, I don't know, four or six months, something like that. And I hadn't been in there in almost three years now. And I went in the other day, it is awful. And I mean awful in so many ways. Like one example is all the machines and equipment that they have there is painted white but everything is so dirty and so black and disgusting that the white is now black. And I am not exaggerating. I wish I would have taken a little video of this. And the crazy part is there was like 15 people working out in this tiny little gym, no air conditioning, half of the things in there were broken. It's completely disgusting, not being cared for at all. How a place like this can stay operational and not get shut down by the city of Miami Beach, I have no clue okay but it was awful and you know the most ridiculous and hypocritical part of all of that to me is the fact that during the the pandemic you know once everything sort of opened back up all these businesses you know were trying to be hypersensitive when it came to cleanliness right like let's have the wet wipes everywhere the disinfecting spray and uh, you know the hand lotion that kills all the germs and all this crap and in the end you know, now that all that's over with and people aren't paying attention to this anymore, it went from bad to worse. Like everything is just so much dirtier and nastier than before. So it was pretty shocking to be quite honest. And uh, needless to say, I'll never be going back there again. The next one, restaurants, guys. Restaurants now are so terrible compared to how they were pre-pandemic because everywhere is more crowded than it used to be, okay? It's more expensive than it used to be. The service is so much worse than it used to be. And the portion size and quality of the food that you're getting for the price has gone down, even though the price has gone up. And it's literally to the point where I, I never really liked eating out that much before, but now, I mean, it's basically something I'm only gonna do a couple times a month. And I have my few spots where I still feel like the value is there for the money, but I'm telling you, it has gotten so much worse since everything opened back up. And I feel like it's one of those things that's probably never gonna recover. And even some of like my favorite restaurants that I used to go to, like Houston's here in Miami used to be one of them. I don't go there anymore. Why not? Because they don't carry my favorite dish, 
which is prime rib. They used to have it pre-pandemic. Now they don't carry prime rib. Why? I have no idea. But it's just another one of those things like something that was really great and was working so well before all the lockdowns. And then afterwards, it's just never the same. Look, guys, I feel like the people that work at the restaurants, you know, the waiters and waitresses, their morale is super low as well because these guys are scraping to get by, especially here in Miami. You know, when you're working off of tips and the cost of living is through the roof here, you know, it's hard to stay motivated to really do a good job or whatever. And a lot of places now are just including the tip in the service. And luckily, I have not had a situation where I had to just say, hey, take this uh, service charge off my check because the service was so terrible. But most of the time when I'm out at these restaurants, it just makes me want to eat at home more, really, because I can do a better job myself making something similar versus paying, you know, their ridiculous prices and getting just mediocre quality food at best. You go to the retail stores like Target or Walmart or anything like that, it's a madhouse now. Like the Target we have over here in Miami on Biscayne Boulevard here is just a joke now, guys, because first of all, they have half the employees working in there that they did pre-pandemic, and you go to the checkout and it's a line a mile long. Even though they do have self-checkout, as well they they just don't have enough employees working the regular checkout lines and when you have 30 items in your cart you need to go to the regular checkout line so you have to wait forever and forget about going to the returns desk or having an online order pick up like i ordered something online there a week or two ago and i went into the store they never had my order ready and this all just reminds me of this video i made a couple weeks ago titled that everything is broken right now and i feel like this completely applies to all these things we're talking about everything is just so busted and broken that was working okay before all of this and i'm starting to wonder now you know we're already year three after the lockdowns here if any of this is ever going to get back to the way it was before or if it's just going to continue to slide downhill because you would think by year three that things would be getting better when it comes to this, but it's actually just getting worse. The grocery store, same thing, you know? Grocery store, you go in there, half the time they don't have a few of the things that you need. Everything costs a fortune. The banks, forget about going into the physical banks nowadays. They, those seem to be the worst, really. I mean, check out this video I have from Bank of America over here. There's literally one person working the counter up there even though they have like four or five slots for people to be up there and this is just like the way it is now and i'm sure a lot of people can relate to this and really the only reason i'm bringing all this up is to just kind of commiserate on this because i know i'm not the only one experiencing all this crap and uh it feels good to vent it a little bit and just get it out and don't worry we're going to get into some more real information after this but um, if you guys can relate to any of these things or you're seeing things that I didn't mention here that are completely just so much worse than they were before, just put it in the comments below so everybody can get an idea of what's going on and different places and services to avoid. And that's kind of how I wanted to end this segment is like we all vote with our feet and we vote with our wallets, guys. So if a business is not doing a good job, whether it's a restaurant or a bank or a grocery store, whatever, switch places, you know, go somewhere else. Because the more you patronize a certain business, the more you're voting with your wallet saying, hey, this is a good place to shop or spend my money. And you just have to knock it off. You have to go to other places and, you know, give the money where it's deserved, you know, and let these businesses that are horrible fail. Because that's the only way that they're pretty much going to wake up and realize, yeah, we're not doing such a good job here. And this kind of leads me right into the next segment here. The other thing that's broken right now, especially in the UK, is being a landlord. In fact, there seems to be a mass exodus of landlords in the UK that want nothing to do with being a landlord there anymore because the returns are basically going negative. You have rents that are just not high enough to keep up with all the taxes they have there and the high interest rates that they have now and all the other expenses that come along with being a landlord. And it's to the point where it's now the first time in 14 years where mortgage payments in the UK are exceeding rental incomes. 
So there's basically no incentive to be a landlord there right now. And finding a cash flowing property is probably next to impossible. And it's estimated right now that close to 40% of the property that's listed on the market there right now is listed by a real estate investor looking to exit. You also have the government there intervening with changes in legislation. They also have things like a 3% surcharge on top of the standard rate of the stamp duty tax. And any of the money you make as a landlord is also subject to income tax over there. So when you add all these things up together, it basically makes no sense to be a landlord there right now. And I know some people are gonna say, oh, well, good for them, Michael. These landlords are greedy. You know, they're charging exorbitant rents and putting people on the street and all this and that. Well, think about it like this, guys. You know, all these landlords are providing people a place to live, right? And there's a good chance that when these landlords go to sell these properties like they are right now, that the people that would want to buy them probably can't, who are the renters right now, because it's still way too expensive. And then you have, you know, mortgage rates at a 40 year high, just like here. So even would be buyers who are now renters there that would like to inherit these properties and buy them from the landlords probably won't even be able to. And who's going to come in and buy them from the landlords if their investment properties and regular home buyers can't afford them? You know, what's the incentive for a new investor to come in and buy it? Probably not, right? It's not really looking too good for a new investor to come in and buy a property like this. So you got to look at the big picture when it comes to real estate and think, well, if landlords and investors don't even want these properties anymore and the average person can't afford to buy them, well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you're just going to have more problems with real estate. You're going to have more empty houses because no one can afford them. And you have all of the taxes and fees and the government rigged manipulation basically taking down the free market in this area. And it's not like landlords can continue raising the rents forever. Obviously tenants only have so much of a budget that they can afford to pay in rents as well. But when you have these fees that continue climbing and you're literally not making a profit, then first of all, if I were in this situation, I would definitely sell and get out of it, even if I had to take a loss because you're already losing anyways. So there's no incentive to remain in the landlord business if this is your situation, first of all. And let's be real guys, the government doesn't provide housing to anybody, okay? They don't build housing, they're not landlords, they don't own a bunch of housing that they rent out to people. And for a long time, being in the landlord business was supposed to be an incentive because you're providing housing to people that need it. And now it's becoming more of a punishment than anything to the point where no one even wants to do it anymore because there's no money left in it. So. I know, like I said, a lot of people are going to be happy to hear that, uh, you know, this is no longer a profitable business and homes are meant to be lived in and not used as investment vehicles. And that's all fine and great until no one lives in the home and then everyone loses. You know what I mean? So that's the problem with this. And this is not just a UK problem either, because look at this. There was a story today out of New York about how many empty units there are in New York while you have so many homeless people on the street. And it's not for the reasons that you would expect. So cool, right? They're all just eating something here. Beautiful. But it's not like San Francisco where you have a bunch of units being left empty by choice by people that just want to keep it empty for one reason or another. What's happening in New York is you have a bunch of these old rent control buildings, right? So New York City has rent control laws and they have about 1 million rent stabilized units there. As of the last count, there was an estimated almost 43,000 of them sitting empty. And the reason why that these units are empty there is because the governments and the rent control laws are making it impossible for the landlords to make these units livable because it's not so simple to just uh, 
you know, put a renter in there and that's it. Because you see, the reason why these units are empty is because they're basically unlivable. They're not up to code to where you can put a new renter in them. So you had somebody who was living in the rent control unit and they either passed away or moved out. And now the owner cannot rent that property to a new tenant because it's not up to code. It's not deemed safe to live in. There's an example here of a two bedroom rent controlled unit in the Bronx that's been vacant for two years now. And the last tenant lived there for 30 years. This is a perfect example of how this works. And she passed away, so now the unit's empty. And the landlord can't rent it to anybody else because the building is from 1910 and the unit needs a ton of work. And we're talking not just some cosmetic repairs, we're talking about you know new appliances, new electrical, new piping, new walls, new flooring, new insulation, tile, windows, uh, removal of lead from the place, okay? And really the list goes on. And the current owner of this place estimates that it would cost about $60,000 for all of these renovations on the property. And like we just said, these renovations and repairs are not optional. These are things that have to be done to get the place up to living standard before the landlord's even allowed to put a new rent control tenant in there, right? And this is the reason why the unit's still empty. Because up until 2019, building owners were allowed to increase the rent by 2.5% of the renovation costs or $250 for every $10,000 they spent. But new laws have now limited the increase to just $15,000 spent and lowered the cost ratio to about half a percent. So after this landlord spends $60,000 in renovations to fix this place up, he's only going to be allowed to raise the rent by $89 and he's going to have to pay about $400 a month out of pocket just to finance all these repairs afterwards. So the person who owns this place is in an impossible situation essentially because renovating it is expensive and after all the renovation costs he'll never recoup the cost that it, that it took to renovate this place, right? And so there's no incentive to do it and the place is just sitting empty because of this. I mean, these two tales of what's happening in the UK with you know nobody wanting to be in the, rent, the landlord business there, and then you have New York City saying that they're all in favor of uh, affordable housing and rent control, trying to keep prices down for everybody, but they're actually part of the problem by helping all these units stay vacant rather than get repaired up to code and have somebody in there for a reasonable price that can afford to pay, you know, basically market rates or maybe a little bit even below that instead of just focusing on these ridiculous rent control laws. So just another example of how the government tries to do something and instead of making it better, they end up making it just far worse than it was before. And it's interesting because all these things that we've been covering so far are totally in line with the title of today's video and just how everything is getting worse, you know? Like, none of this stuff is making anything better. You hear these terms like the great reset and you'll own nothing and be happy and all of this. I don't know, guys, maybe there's some truth to that because the way things are going, it seems like the only way that things can get back to any sort of normalcy ever again is going to be some sort of great reset because the way everything's working right now, it's not. It's not working at all, actually. And here's the latest story out of Florida when it comes to property taxes. There is a new proposal in the Florida legislature this week talking about reducing the homestead property tax cap down to 2%. And right now, the annual tax cap is at 3% or the change in the CPI, whichever is lower. So obviously we know CPI is much higher than 3% right now. So you're talking 3% maximum. And what they wanna do is reduce it to 2%. And right away, that might sound like, oh, this is great. You know, we're gonna have a reduction in property taxes. But there is the other side of the coin. And they're saying that it's estimated that this can cause local governments and counties to be losing about $150 million a year, but they don't even have a detailed projection on this yet, so they really don't even know how much could be lost by doing this. They're doing this to try to make sure the cost of living remains low for people that actually reside here and you know own real estate here as a, a longtime owner of the property, right? But 
Some people are saying they should be focusing more on the insurance problem, which is a much bigger issue than how much our property taxes are going up. And the issue with this property tax situation is that it's going to affect some counties a lot more than others because you have some rural counties here in Florida that don't have nearly as big of a tax base. And if they actually pass this tax cut, then these areas that already don't have a lot of money won't have hardly anything to work with. But trust me, there's no sympathy coming from my end here because we know just how much the government is terrible at managing resources, budgeting, and spending money. So to me, what this would do is it would force them to do more with less, which would be a great thing. But the way things typically go is it'll probably just get worse, just like everything else we've talked about here. And, you know, we'll just make places that are poor even poorer. Of course, this new property tax cut proposal is being backed by Miami-Dade County, but of course we're basically the most populous county in all of Florida, and we would stand to lose about $7 million a year in revenue, but our budget is $11 billion. So when you're talking $11 billion versus $7 million, it's still a drop in the bucket. But when you scale that down to smaller counties, you know, that might be losing a lot more money if they're losing a couple million but their annual budget is you know only a couple hundred million then that can have a more significant impact you know now as a florida resident and a property owner here i can kind of see the pros and cons of this i also think the insurance issue is so much bigger right now than worrying about a one percent difference in the property taxes but at the same time because i'm in miami-dade county and i pay the highest property taxes in the whole state i wouldn't mind having my property taxes go down by one percent okay so that would be great but you know for example if i lived in a less populated county in florida where home prices are more normal and uh, things are not nearly as expensive as here, you know, and I'm saving maybe four or $500 a year on my property taxes, I'd be far less concerned about that and way more concerned about, you know, my insurance premiums that just doubled or tripled on my house. And, uh, you know, that's unsustainable. So I do think that the insurance is a much bigger issue that these guys should be worrying about right now instead of this, as much as I would like to have lower property taxes when you're in charge of running the entire state or a government i think everything's about priorities right and the priority should be the biggest problem which is definitely the homeowner's insurance here because a lot of people can't even get homeowner's insurance half the time and these new roof requirements are absolutely ridiculous you know a lot of companies won't even insure you if your roof is more than 10 years old so imagine you know the financial cost of getting a new roof every 10 years that's totally out of the question so Something needs to be done about this. And once again, it's just another one of those things that has gotten worse. Just like everything else we covered in today's video. And I know a lot of this might have sound really negative, but listen guys, it's the reality and I think it's worth acknowledging and it's good to let the frustration out. You know, I feel like a video like this can offer that to the, everybody who made it this far, right? Because if you just listen to everything I just said, then you can probably really relate to everything I just said and uh, can feel the pain, you feel the frustration, and it's good to talk about it, it's good to let it out. So hopefully this helped you just as much as it helped me. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't wanna wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here, and I'll see you in the next one.